Hi, Tyler. Thanks for joining me, friend. Hi, Tashin. Nice to be here. That's what people say at the beginning of podcast episodes. Apparently, they have this sort of cordiality face thing. You know? about, I hate it here. <laughs> it sucks to be here. <laughs> I only did this because you asked me to. That, I'm sure, you I'm know, sure it's a joy to be in this podcast room with you. Yes, this is digital <laughs> space that we find ourselves in. Um, good. So, yeah, I think. We've been friends for some time since I was in San Francisco. I think we probably met around then, 2018, 2019. We've been connected since then. And, you know, you've lived a very interesting life with a lot of chapters so far and many more to come, I'm sure. And for me, this podcast is first and foremost really a chance to, yeah, the metaphor I like to use is like paint a portrait of someone. Like, who is this person and what are they on about and what is their character like and what is their soul drawing them towards? And of course, I paint that portrait through conversation and through questions. And um, the first question, as you know, that I love to ask people is about their life story. I would love to hear about yours. Anything you'd like to share? Do feel free to be, you know, playful or silly or indirect or metaphorical or, you know, just straight up. Um, you can answer in a short way, a long way, whatever feels good for you. Yeah. And as you know, I do. I hate hate this question, but I think it's also a good question. So, I mean, the, the reason I hate it is not because it's a bad question. The reason I hate it is because I I struggle to answer it in a way that isn't scripted. Mm. And so you mentioned I could clown the answer. It feels insincere right now for some reason. So maybe, maybe the thing I'll try is to answer it in a sincere way that feels uh, not scripted, but it's still the, my life story. I love that life story how do people answer this question well okay um i grew up in uh mayapak new york well i was born in peekskill new york it's upstate new york um and then grew up in mayapak new york which um that's that's what you call it if you're in the 21st century it was supposed to be mahopak and then like um irish and italian people moved in and called it mayapak um and yeah, I, I two loving parents, but a, a pretty like uh, nasty kind of macho environment um, that eventually I was happy to flee from uh, for college when I, I went to New York City. Uh, and college was this thing called the Macaulay Honors College, which is crazy. Um, they give you free tuition. Uh, it's part of the, the CUNY system, the City University of New York. And um, they were trying to create some initiative to, I guess, grab students who would normally go to like liberal arts colleges or like IVs and things like that. And so they kind of like bribe you. And <laughs> the way they bribe you is free tuition. They give you uh, over $7,000 of study abroad money and they give you a laptop. Um, and then as a result of that, I fell in love with New York City like very, very deeply uh, partially because of the structure of this thing, which lets you or even encourages you to take classes all over the City University of New York system, which is uh, not a lot of people know. It's like hundreds of thousands of students in the system and like 21 different colleges, um, I think like seven or eight major ones across the city. And so I was kind of just like gallivanting around, um, looking up professors on ratemyprofessor.com, um, take like and just taking classes from like all the five star ones basically um which turns out it was a terrible decision because the the, the five star ones are just like the easy ones i mean they're they, i have like fantastic teachers but um i didn't go for any of the ones who are like um the you know the the ones who challenge you like one of those movie professors um yeah and then i got obsessed with I, at the time i was doing graphic design and like art direction um, then that led me to an interest in, in cognitive science because um, it seemed to me that like graphic design is just this way to visually interface with minds to try to compel them to, to try to elicit some action or mood or, or something like that. So then I went deep down the cognitive science hole to the point where I almost got a PhD and I'm glad I didn't uh, because at the same time my, uh, my mom uh, had the idea that I should run a mobile cognitive science lab, like cognitive science on wheels. And I, for some reason, I really liked that idea. So then I 
uh, created one of those. I think the reason I hate telling my life stories is just so random. <laughs> it's just like this led to that. Then I, and, and it's each thing is like kind of a strange, unique thing, but it doesn't cohere. So anyway, yeah, I, um, I ran this mobile cognitive science lab for uh, maybe like a year and a half or a couple of years that I fundraised for. Um, and that ended up getting adopted by the University of Chicago through a long securities route. Um, and then at the tail end of that, um, that that's continued to run, but then I discovered effective altruism um, and got really heavily into that um, to the point where I was like running the annual effective altruism conference and like coordinating funding and talent throughout the movement. And I was at uh, the, the Center for Effective Altruism at Oxford, but working in uh, the San Francisco Bay Area, while meanwhile also hanging out a lot with the infamous Leverage Research um, which is so fascinating, like a very fascinating topic. Um, they're like a think do tank, or they were in the Bay Area that was funded by a bunch of like uh, tech billionaires <laughs> and full of like the, the kind of the hardest core effective altruists or a lot of them. And then I went from there to encountering Monastic Academy. Um, and I think that's when you came into the picture and then I got like very interested in meditation and all sorts of esoteric stuff. Like I ended up in, in that time also studying energy healing for two years. Um, I don't know what energy is and I don't believe in healing, but that's what I studied. And I, I think it's like a cool skill set. Um, <laughs> and then, uh, yeah, then what happened? Oh, then I got really burnt out just from going so heavily on the EA stuff. Um, and essentially just like was depressed and chronically ill uh, with a condition I still kind of have um, in bed. It, it was like stuck in bed for like close to two years, not really able to do much. Um, and then the pandemic hit as I was just getting out of that. So I was like on the tail end of that. And then I was like, yes, ready to face the world again. And then the same month, like the pandemic hit, <laughs> it like plunged the world back into interiority. Um, uh, but then during the pandemic, I organized like a, a few different quarantine bubble villages where people had to test in and then could socialize with one another internally. And that was very interesting. That happened in Portugal largely. Um, and then from there, ended up moving eventually back to New York City, um, where I joined the Fractal Co-Housing Collective, uh, which is like a network of different apartments all over the city, largely in Bushwick, that kind of share their living rooms or just generally hang out. Um, and then built on top of that with a few friends, um, Fractal University, which is the main thing that I focus on now, alongside a near-term science fiction novel that I'm writing where everyone becomes psychic. <laughs> So I, think, I think that's the nutshell. There it <laughs> it's is. An interesting version of a life story, though, because it's like, here's what I here's what I did. Like I left out like a few times I like fell in love. And those are like equally important parts of a life story. But it just feels like not what you say on a podcast. Mm. Anyway, that's one that's one attempt. Kind of it was kind of rambly in the end. Mm. Presented all the highlights. Yeah. 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 Um, what were you like as a kid? Mm, I was actually very different as a kid. Um, I was very internal, super introverted. I'm still introverted. It's just, I don't look, look like it. Um, but as a kid, I was like mostly just in my room all day, like playing with Legos and creating a little world with my action figures. Um, those are the good days. Yeah, the good days. <laughs> it all went downhill from there. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I, I pretty much, I didn't really, ha like, I had a friend here or there. Friends weren't really a big part of my life. Being outside of my room was not a big part of my life. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I, I, like, these days I smile a lot and, like, laugh a lot. But back then, I think I just, I, as far as I'm told, I didn't really smile that much. Mm. And I had a kind of penetrating gaze. <laughs> But mostly I didn't make a lot of eye contact either. I, I picked that up like later on when I realized, oh, you're supposed to do that. Um, but yeah, I was a kind of I was a kind of like little little nerd storyteller kid making up my own little worlds. What about you? What were you like as a kid? 
Oh, let's stay with you for now. Uh, um, it's a similar though. Similar. Uh, mm -hmm. I wonder. I wonder if he would be how he would feel about you now, younger Tyler. Mm. How do you think he would feel about you? Well, I think he would regard me just as straight up like a different person. Mm. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, how would he feel about me? The, the funny thing is back in that, like now most of my headspace is dominated by often how I feel about people and my relationships. Like that's a huge part of my life. Mm. Back then, it's just not something I really ever thought about. Even, yeah, even with my little friendships that sometimes I had, the friendships were almost always about creating imaginary worlds together. Mm. And so the relationship wasn't really in focus. And so it's it's difficult to answer how he would feel about me because I'm not sure how he really felt about anyone. It just wasn't, it was like, you know, when you do the camera lens thing where it's like the background blurs, that type of thing was in the background. But I think he would like, I think he would like me. <laughs> with kids <laughs> uh -huh, uh -huh. what kind of imaginary worlds inspired you at the time or what qualities really made you happy with one of the worlds you were building as a kid mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. typically a lot of room for possibility you know they weren't like um chamber music style like tiny relationship dramas um they were um you know vast adventures uh competing empires uh n you know new worlds uh alien a lot of aliens <laughs> <laughs> huge amount of aliens let's go central theme uh -huh. um yeah action and uh i think also a lot of like alliances there was an interest in like good guys teaming up typically to fight aliens mm. <laughs> mm. Yeah. but generally the they were characterized by like kind of anything anything goes within but within like kind of sci-fi rules rather than fantasy rules like i liked I, and I continue to like universes that feel like they're a little bit more um, rule bound, but then they play a lot within those rules. Hmm. Like, okay, if they're hoverboards that stay, you know, two feet of the ground off the ground, you can't just suddenly have one that goes a hundred feet off the ground unless it's like hacked hmm. to do that or super powered or something like that. Yeah. Hmm. I've seen you write about this, but how did that shift start to happen where you were still at your core like introverted but you started to learn social skills and stuff like that mm -hmm. well it was largely just out of wanting to get all the good things in life which at the time i thought would be accessed via joining the popular crowd mm -hmm. um <laughs> which was a terrible thing to try to do because the popular crowd at my school was just not very kind um pretty much universally and uh so after a lot of failed attempts the there was like this one critical moment where uh this girl who used to belong to my school and i guess we connected over myspace or something and she proposed that we meet up at the jefferson valley mall which is like the place to see and be seen um and then i kind of but with with her and her friend who were both like um I guess the language I would have used back then was hot. They were hot girls. And so <laughs> I wanted to impress these two hot girls who didn't know that I was like, um, uh, a, like a, in the category of the loser. That's mm. like the kind of the archetype I was in back then. Mm. And so I kind of like invented a new personality for them on the spot. Well, it wasn't really invented. Like it wasn't effortful. It was just like, it needed to happen. It felt like life or death stakes. Like I needed to be, <laughs> someone who could get the timing right in conversation and like make a joke and have people laugh and then so I just became that guy like very rapidly um and then I kind of got stuck in that personality after that because it was very successful um like that day ended in um one of the two girls that I was with wanting to like get with me mm. which never happened before 
Um, and that, like, I think just caused some kind of dopamine cascade that made this personality just become like my new personality. <laughs> hmm. Yeah. How would you say you relate to those kinds of dynamics now? Uh, like specifically like connecting to people, um, like mm, you describe yourself as still being introvert, but you've kind of like learned these skills and how to connect to people. And, you know, you had this sort of dopamine cascade where that personality became maybe like a mask for a while. How do you, how do you relate to all of that now? Well, I, I find myself often wanting to go the opposite way now that, um, like, I think the personality that I invented is like really good for making people comfortable and like the initial stages of getting to know one another. Um, but now I, the challenge for me feels like almost regressing. And I think we all have to do this as, as adults to a certain extent. I think whether we've realized it or not, almost everyone has like gained some kind of adult persona, typically shaped by um, higher education or uh, our, you know, professional demands or just like, you know, watching movies and hanging out in public. Um, and I think it's a huge barrier to intimacy at a certain point. And I think at a certain point you have to like peel, I don't know what the right metaphor is. Peel feels kind of violent, but <laughs> I think at the very least you have to let what whatever that was built on top of like have a resurgence I've been picturing like one of those oil, what do you call it? Refineries or something or the pumps that like mm. gets the thing to come up. Yeah. And I struggle with that. Mm. Except if it's like some kind of, I don't know, uh, authentic relating game, that mm. becomes a lot easier. What's the struggle like? Mm. For me, it's like um, typically a sense of like mortal fear uh, mm. of switching back to that previous mode of socially operating where that the mortal fear i mean the fear is like the fear of exclusion essentially um which i think for you know many years in human history was the fear of death oh bye girlfriend um that's my girlfriend leaving um yeah and then yeah, every time I try to go back into it, it feels like, yeah, just sheer terror, basically. Um, and I think it's a terror also at, like, loss, like losing all the good things in my life, which were kind of, um, which were largely kind of acquired, you might say, by using this more charismatic mode of operating. Hmm. What do you think is the potential reward of, like, reintegrating that? sort of younger, more introverted way of being? Mm -hmm. I think it's just feeling, I, I think it would probably make me much more socially at ease. Like, I mm -hmm. think I, I probably look very socially at ease. I get this feedback a lot. Um, mm -hmm. But I pretty much always feel awkward mm -hmm. <laughs> when interacting with other people, unless we're like extremely close. Mm -hmm. And even then. Um, and so I think there's just often a sense of, yeah, internal sheer. And then, uh, yeah, like a, a not really knowing how to cope with that, this feeling of like kind of being two types of people at least at once. Hmm. And it's not like the new, like the, the personality that I typically socially go with is inauthentic. It's actually like by this point, very organic and mm -hmm. it's just as much me. Um, it's just, it just feels a little bit less whole. Maybe that's the thing. Yeah. If if let's say these dynamics kept working themselves through you and over let's say like we fast forwarded five years from now and they were just like completely smoothly integrated or something like that, what do you imagine that would look like? Mm. Mm. Or feel like for you? I mean, when I see people who seem like very naturally at ease, um, yeah, I assume it would look kind of like that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Just, uh, true, true chill. True well, chill. Not, maybe not chill. Chill is like the wrong word, but like, yeah, at ease, at peace with oneself, something like that. Mm 
And I think just that that's downstream typically of less internal conflict. Mm. Can you tell me about this period of your life where you got interested in energy work and healing and stuff like that and what that was like and what made you interested in that and what, if anything, you learned? Yeah. Yeah, that's a crazy story. Um, uh, so like I said, I was I was hanging out a lot with um, the Leverage crew in, in the Bay Area at the time. And one thing they were interested in uh, was psychology in the mind that was a huge interest uh, the thinking being that um if you look at all the problems in the world except natural disasters they're almost always downstream of humans mm. and how humans behave um and then so if you want to interface with human behavior then you have to interface with like individual humans and then also groups and then it helps to understand the dynamics of the mind because that's what drives behavior largely um i think there's some ways where that line of thought isn't quite correct especially if you start thinking of like the influence of environments. Um, but uh, yeah, so at the time there, there was a lot of like kind of informal, kind of like early stage science research into psychology in this crowd. And meanwhile, one of the funders um, was interfacing with this group of energy healing people um, in the Luminous Awareness Institute uh, headed by Annalisa Edelberg. And uh, the crowd, the leverage crowd was like, kind of like, if you picture like the, um, the oh, you, you've, you've met the rationalists, you've been even maybe even a part of the rationalists, like they were very influenced by the rationalists. And, uh, and a lot of them had backgrounds in scientific subjects or analytical philosophy. So there was a lot of skepticism toward just the very idea of energy healing, because it falls so outside of the Overton window of that kind of mindset. Uh, but uh, a cool thing about this group is that they were also incredibly open-minded. Um, I'm sure it also made a big difference that this particular, it was like a funder saying like, hey, check this out. <laughs> and so um, the group was like, okay. Um, and uh, went over uh, this funder's house and there was Annalisa Edelberg uh, like in the middle of the room, kind of like doing whatever with the energy. Um, and then, uh, she brought us into a circle and we started like synchronizing our breath and making sounds together. Um, and then she started doing like fancy things with her hands around people. Uh, and as a result, um, this room full of skeptics ended up like have twitching, crying, um, having like mini little seizure like things um huge emotional releases uh and i personally at some point like blacked out and like then woke up on the floor and like looked around and it was like a disaster zone of uh of like regression and emotional release <laughs> mm. um from all these like uh you know sciency types uh, and that was my it was also just mind blowing to see people um, seemingly respond in such immediate ways to whatever she was doing um, and without touching them. And then sometimes she would even be behind someone's back and like doing something and you would see their back respond. And I remember watching that and being like, how does that, how is that working? Cause that, it wasn't easy to come up with a story where it's like the, the, the person was just playing along um, both because of how quick the response was and because they like, I don't know how they would have sensed her hand moving in a particular way behind their back. I mean, you could tell a story where it was like there was some kind of temperature cue or an audio cue or like feeling the air as she's like moving her hands. But that's like equally as magical. <laughs> the idea that um, we're that sensitive to these uh, cues that we already understand that um, that could elicit such an um, intense and immediate response from someone's hand at a distance. Um, it's still that, which is by the way, still my favorite explanation for a mm. lot of the energy stuff that it's just like, um, humans are much, much more sensitive than we realize, except we've similar to the way, like I was talking about earlier, where we've built these personas atop, um, like earlier things. I, I think that's also true in that, like, I, I, I essentially think that we're exquisitely sensitive and then we're just like filtering out, 
enormous amounts of that sensitivity because we haven't built the world to make it so that that kind of sensitivity would even be useful. Like, what do you use it for other than energy healing or I guess having satisfying relationships, but that's just like not what the incentives of the world are set up for. Um, and so, yeah, like my preferred explanation is something um, that I started coming to when I started reading uh, Richard Feynman, actually, and he was interested in uh, human sensory capacity. And there's this famous anecdote of uh, how he got interested in bloodhounds and their ability to smell. And he wanted to see like, what are, what's the limit of the human ability to smell? And so he would at parties, like touch a few books, uh, like take a few books off the shelf and touch a few and then put them back and then go into a different room and, oh, wait, 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 I'm mixing it up. While he was out of the room, he would have people at the party touch a few books and put them back on the shelf. And then he would come back in and like sniff the books hmm. and according to him, um, accurately guess which ones had been touched. Huh. Um, and, you know, he wasn't like a lifelong trainee in smellonomics or whatever. Um, and so that just makes me think, um, I mean, there could be some additional thing, energy, like, you know, there's, there's some people who posit that um, brains are actually interfacing with weak electromagnetic fields um, and maybe moving your hands around can interface with those. Although my preferred explanation right now is just that um, we're interfacing with these older like evolutionary systems that equipped us to be really sharp in um, sensory contexts. And then now we're in a world where it's like, we don't really have to pay attention to our senses that much to succeed. Hmm. Um, anyway, so yeah, that's that happened. And then I got really interested in this uh, energy healing stuff. And so I enrolled in Annalisa's school for two years, hmm. um, which was part-time. It wasn't like I, I was at Hogwarts for two years. It, it was like um, a thing where every couple months there would be a retreat. Hmm. Yeah. I'm trying to think how to ask this question. <clears throat> What would you say you learned from that for yourself that you maybe still use now or that has been stayed with you since then? Mm. I think the most important thing was um, mm, well, um, you know, so in this program, they teach you, I'm just going to use the term energy, even though I don't know what it is. Um, they teach you how to attend to other people's energy as you're just like, you know, for instance, walking around. And it turns out when you start doing that, like the world starts feeling really alive. Um, and I think previous to encountering a lot of this stuff, I often felt very alienated from um, other people around me. Um, not maybe not people I was close with, but like walking around the street, I would have felt kind of alienated from like the average person. Um, to the point where I think I even engaged in the type of thinking I sometimes see online of calling people NPCs. <laughs> um, because you you like look out and you see people just like following these rigid pat patterns of behavior and scripts. And, um, you know, like the matrix was like really influential on me when I was a kid. So I think that influenced a lot of my uh, early, uh, ideology or something. And so that's, I think I was like looking out at the world and just seeing people like following these rigid patterns and it felt disconnected. But, um, when you learn how to do whatever this thing is, which is sense other people's energy, then you start feeling like you could connect with like literally anyone, like, um, a random homeless person, like, a, a resident nurse named Karen, like the plumber or whatever. Um, it becomes really easy to find some like channel of connection that's pretty much always available. And so that's just really enhanced my um, everyday life. I would say just being able to walk around and, f and feel like I can sense something mm -hmm. uh, like get something from, from other people. And um, there's another thing I was going to say. Um,
Oh yeah. And then the, the crazy thing is um, you don't actually need much training to, to get this sense. Maybe you want to call it. Um, I've, I've pretty successfully been anyone who's been curious about being able to find it. I've been able, even people who are kind of like on the autism spectrum, it seems like pretty intuitive to find it once it's pointed out, hmm. which is like a, a wild thing and continues to have me think that it was like just a natural sense and or communication modality for like older humans and probably most other animals that we've just stopped paying attention to. Hmm. How do you like to point it out to folks? Um, it depends on the person. But the, <laughs> I mean, the easiest one is you just pretend that it's there. Mm. Like the main thing that gets in the way of people sensing it is typically w the thing that I had when I first encountered it, which was skepticism. Mm. Um, and so the way to get around that is you just um, pretend that other people have energy <laughs> and that you can sense it. And um, and you have to play pretend in the way that kids play pretend, not the way adults play pretend, which is like, you have to really thrust yourself into the scenario in which this is true. Like if, you know, if you're a kid and you're playing pretend and you're the, you're the prince or whatever, then you really have to like, believe you're the prince kind of, um, temporarily or provisionally or something. So it's like you, you let yourself fall and you can, a lot of people are afraid to do this actually. So, um, they're afraid of going crazy which is reasonable. Um, so the thing I often like to do when I'm playing with like dramatically new beliefs is set like a timer, um, maybe for two minutes where that alternate world is true. And then like, let myself be in that world and then know that at the end of the timer, then I'll like bring myself back to normal. And from that normal state, if I like believe that thing is still true, then I'll maybe further investigate it. Um, but there's a sense I feel like I've developed a good sense through doing that when like what what's placebo and what's not after doing that over and over. Um, yeah. So I would just play pretend that's the, <laughs> that's the mm. normal way to point it out. And then if, and then if people struggle with that, then I'll like give more specific instructions. Um, yeah. Like um, another way is, uh, and I'll tell them to keep playing pretend, but I'll say like, imagine that you have like some kind of ghost current flowing through your arms and your body. Uh, like just imagine that that's there. And since it's there, um, like sense what it's like, like feel what that kind of like ghost current is like, like it could be like a little stream, but it feels kind of like ineffable, not easily describable by language, like feel into that. And then once they feel that, I'll say, now imagine that you can feel the same thing in other people's bodies or around their bodies. Um, that's another way of doing it. Mm. So you had this. <laughs> Not what I thought I would get into. <laughs> this is like the most esoteric part of my life that I never talk about. <laughs> uh, so you had this period of. Mind if I eat a little, eat a few nuts, by the way, I forgot. To Go eat for it. Okay, cool. You had this period of burnout for like two years. What is your sense of what caused that period? And what's your sense of how you got out of it? Mm. Mm -hmm. Um, My sense of what caused it is, mm, I came to believe that the only source of value in the world was, um, well, actually, let me rewind. It was more like I got really into this idea of kind of being a servant of the world. Um, and almost turning myself into like an instrument or a, a tool or something like that. And as a tool, I would try to get rid of any personal need that I had and um, would try to like minimize the amount of emotions that got in the way of me doing um, important work. <laughs> mm. And it just turns out that if you, if you instrumentalize yourself like that repeatedly for a while, like at the start, it can feel kind of like um, it can feel very exciting because um, having like a purpose unlocks an enormous amount of energy but then eventually it 
it tends to flip is what I see or saw in myself and see in other people, which is like, you know, um, life isn't about one thing <laughs> and actually um, having a purpose and like your entire life being about the purpose, I think is actually just kind of crazy. <laughs> I, I mean, I think it's useful for people to find a purpose and then provisionally like treat it like it's the only thing in their lives. But um, what I often see in people who get really excited about purpose, including myself at the time, was that you you start like failing to give yourself um, the, the other nutrients in life that you need. You only give yourself like the nutrients that are useful for that purpose. So, you know, at the time I I was actually exercising a lot because you know, I read a few studies or, um, you know, in some meta-analyses that like cardio is really good for focus and like sustained focus and, um, uh, and productivity. <laughs> and so I was like, cool. So I'm going to run up a hill every day. Um, but I didn't come across any studies <laughs> that linked, um, like experiencing love to being very productive. <laughs> I'm sure if I did, then I would have been like, okay, I'm going to optimize <laughs> being uh, love, which would have been really problematic for reasons I could get into. But um, like, I think there are all sorts of things in life beyond whatever we find as our purpose um, that we just need. Um, and they're different for each person, uh, but there are like other, there are other things that are ends in themselves. Um, and for me, I just started like really neglecting all of those. Um, or at a certain point when I realized that I was burning out because I was neglecting those, I tried to like do those only in so much as they enabled me to be productive again. Hmm. Um, but if you start regarding things that are kind of more like ends as means, it has, I don't know how exactly how it works, but it has this effect of hollowing them out. I think it happens because you're paying a different type of attention to them. Like, um, a simple way of pointing this out is if you remember what it was like to be in school and to be like assigned a book, like a novel, even if it's a really good novel, I remember at the time I was paying a type of attention to these novels that w would just make it so that I could do like the summary of them afterwards or mm -hmm. like, uh, extract the information I needed to pass the test. And if you simulate yourself doing that while reading a really good novel, it stops being enjoyable at least in the it stops being enjoyable as a really good novel it's it might be enjoyable as like um you know a, a skill challenge to extract information to pass a test but there's a richness to things in the world that if you pay a more narrow type of attention to them you kind of like lose the relational richness of the thing like what makes a novel work is not just these pieces of information that i need to get an a but like you know feeling into how the language supports the characters and how the characters are interacting and how the plot is like constraining the characters actions and all these sorts of things. And, you know, you can't really enumerate them though. It's like a whole, like artists are creating a whole. And um, I think this instrumentalizing attitude where I was trying to engage these holes as parts to like essentially fuel my purpose um was hollowing me out i was like it was i was trying to like turn them into coal basically that i like put into the furnace of like this mech suit that i had created for myself and then things that did not power the mech suit i just stopped doing and then in, unless i could figure out how to cause them to power the mech suit but then like they yeah they lost they lost their um richness hmm. and how did you get out um, I didn't really get out. <laughs> I, uh, yeah, it, I didn't have like a revelatory moment or a new environment that got me out. I just like kept going down further to the bottom of the well mm. <laughs> until I couldn't do it anymore. Like I physically could not work. And, um, I now actually think, you know, I, it's still up in the air, whether I had some kind of like post viral thing that um gave me a chronic gut condition which i struggled with for a while and that like um also interacted with my depression but i now i now more think it was a psychosomatic thing or at least like um a way of using my nervous system where i was constantly trying to like rev my nervous system into sympathetic mode uh to do 18 hour days was the mm -hmm. ideal 
usually mm -hmm. I would only get like 14 to 16. Um, but then eventually I just not only couldn't do that many hours, but um, after uh, a bunch of months, like just was not able to even like get out of bed very easily. Um, even to use the bathroom was like, that was like a goal. Eventually that was like a gold star of my day, like being able to accomplish that. <laughs> mm. But um, yeah, I think essentially my body mind was not going to let me keep operating that way. Um, and so I had to come up, like I was, I was kind of forced to come up with an alternative. I wasn't like, I wasn't lucky enough to stumble upon one <laughs> in the meantime, mm. especially because I'd surrounded myself with people who were operating in similar ways. Although um, to be fair, and few of them were as crazy as I was. Like, um, I think I was, I, I, I kind of prided myself on being the one to take the philosophy as rigorously as possible. The idea that like every second that I spent not, um, like saving a life was essentially killing a life through omission. And I didn't want to be like guilty of killing people. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I went too far. Well, you're clearly not spending all day in bed now. Like what is, what, how do you go about living your life now? That's different than that. Mm. Well, mm. you also don't seem to be like grinding to be the like savior of the world or something like that. Like, I don't know. Um, I see you engaging in projects that you care about and working on them and showing up in the world, but also seemingly enjoying your life and doing things that you find fun and, like just because, or, I mean, I, I don't know what it's like to be of you, of course, but that's the impression I get. Yeah. Well, I'm, I was able to eventually get out of it. I think through some like, almost like philosophical revelations. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the first one was within the view of effective altruism, which is um, like just demonstrably trying to do effective altruism this way. Um, undermines itself mm. and i saw it in tons of my peers who burnt mm -hmm. out and went through similar journeys some and people continue to go through that kind of thing so like if you're trying to be really effective so that you can save and improve other people's lives but you're operating in this way that causes you to maybe be able to do that like very powerfully for two years and then burn out for four years or longer sometimes for a lifetime and in, in some cases i see um then like that's not very effective. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so just even from within the ideology, like my way of operating started to crack. And that was useful. Um, what was even more useful was just um trying to understand value itself and what I was regarding as being valuable. Um yeah. Uh I was I was like, I think for me, working on saving and improving people's lives was an kind of an end in itself, but um, I didn't really have any external measure to tell me that that was a better end than all the other things in my life that are ends. Like, um, I there, I didn't believe in a, in a sort of Abrahamic God that said, like, this is this is the good thing to do and these are the bad things to do. So I didn't have that external force telling me what to do. Um, I also didn't feel like I there was a force in the universe um, or some kind of objective moral uh, law that was telling me, <clears throat> excuse me, um, these are the good things to do and um, these are the things that are bad or don't count. And then so I had to ask myself, like, why, why do I prize this so much more then, um, I don't know, like the end in itself of eating like yesterday, I had a really good taquito mm. and I don't know if you've ever had a taquito, but it's like the, the crunch of the mm. outside is so amazing. And then you get to the warm inside and, um, like why is savoring that moment less important than this other end? Um, and I didn't actually have a good rigorous answer for that. <laughs> and so that was interesting to me. And I realized that um, what one thing that does make you prize one end over the other ends is if you feel like you're in an emergency situation with it. 
Um, so, you know, if you're starving, then maybe you seek out the, the like intrinsic good of eating. Um, well, I guess you could say that's not an intrinsic good cause it like keeps you alive, but uh, that's a bad example actually. Um, but I think you do see people who are like starved. For, let's say you've eaten soup, the same kind of soup, like every day uh, of every month for a year and you're getting really tired of it. Um, if suddenly, even like if someone gives you uh, like a pack of gushers, even if you don't like gushers, probably you're going to be like, oh, yes, because <laughs> it's an end in itself to experience. You, you've been like starving for this this kind of like spiritual nutrient, which is maybe like novel tastes. Um, and um Right. And so I think I was put into a kind of emergency situation with this one particular type of end by the Peter, the, cl the classic Peter Singer drowning child thought experiment, um, which uh, for those who haven't heard of it, it's like, imagine you see a kid drowning in a shallow puddle of water and like nobody is helping them or seeming to notice them. And like you could save them, but let's say you're wearing like very expensive shoes I don't know how much it costs to save a life these days, but let's say like $2,000 shoes um, given to you by your grandfather. <laughs> I don't know. So maybe they even a lot of, have a lot of sentimental value. Um, the question is like, do you wade into this shallow pond to save the kid, even if it means probably messing up your shoes? Mm -hmm. And at the very least, that's going to cost you $2,000. Um, and then most people say like, yes, um, you're, you're like morally obligated to do that. Um, and then Peter Singer like turns it around on you and says like, well, for roughly the same price as the shoes, imagine you could save a life, um, somewhere in let's say sub-Saharan Africa by, um, causing someone to not get malaria because you, you provide bed nets or something like that. Um, don't you feel like you're similarly moral obli morally obligated to save that metaphorical drowning child? And at that point, either people like reject the thought experiment, which is most people, because it seems, I, I think partially because it just seems really overwhelming. Like, how are you supposed to live a life when you're constantly trying to save drowning children? Um, or they embrace it and either feel guilty that they're not living up to a certain standard of like saving all the drowning children, or they become like a really hardcore EA like I was, and they do <laughs> overwhelm themselves um, because every second that they're not um, doing the equivalent of saving a drowning child, they're like imagining that people are dying. Mm. Um, and I think the the reason I ended up emphasizing that particular like like good, you might say in my life, um, the good of helping other people over everything else was because uh, because of the urgency of that thought experiment. Like, of course, I'm not going to watch a movie if some kid is drowning in front of me. Like, of course, I'm not going to fall in love if... Uh, someone is dying of malaria, like I'm going to go save them. Mm. Um, however, um, yeah, I don't, I don't actually think you, as I said before, I don't think you can operate effectively as an effective altruist if you're operating with that kind of urgency all the time. And I think also um, if you're, I, I don't think that kind of emergency situation should crowd out your other values. Like eventually you just do need to, if you're a movie person, you just do need to watch a movie. <laughs> and, yeah. and then it's, it sounds crazy to say, but like, I think you should value that just as much as these other things in your life yeah. and like figure out how to balance or maybe not as much, but um, you should figure out a, a, like an ecology of, of these goods, like how to balance them essentially. And not just because if you don't, then you're going to burn out and get depressed, which I think you are, but because those things are just good. That's what good is. That's what we mean <laughs> by, by um, good. Yeah. You have written about this um, idea of fractal altruism. How mm -hmm. would you describe that and its relationship to the philosophy of effective altruism that you had previously? Mm hmm. Yeah, so fra fractal altruism is kind of my own attempt to evolve the ideology of effective altruism toward encompassing 
other things that are good <laughs> in people's lives. Mm. And then um, the easiest, most pithy way of describing it is like um, practicing uh, kindness at every single scale um, where there's the scale of the world and that's the scale that most effective altruists operate at. But then there's also the scale of like you and the things that you care about. And then there are the things that, um, you know, your family and your local community care about. And I think the way of uh, prioritizing all of these is by finding this uh, balance across the scales. And that's kind of like this, this thought of effective or fractal altruism. Mm. Although I'm debating whether to call it um, fractalism instead. Mm. One friend was trying to persuade me of that because she was thinking that fractal altruism is, is still like too, it's a, it's too much reacting to a different ideology when it should be its own thing. I'm curious mm. what you think. Of that. Mm. I'm not sure I have an opinion about um, which name would be better, but it just is compelling. I think that um, I've arrived at sort of similar stuff for myself and it's like, yeah, this is what's good and true. And so I'm like, I don't know. I don't think I have an opinion about the name, but I, I like the idea very much. One one interesting thing that was pointed out about it by a friend was that it's a lot like Confucianism, mm. <laughs> which is a weird comparison. But um, like um, if you look into Confucianism, there's a lot of stuff on, uh, yeah, essentially like making all the scales harmonize with one another to create um, a functional society. Mm. And so I'm interested in re researching that at some point. I haven't gotten deep into it yet. Mm. what do you think are the nutrients that you've needed to add to your life or connect to or reconnect to or balance to feel happier and like your life is more fulfilling on its own terms i think the biggest one was just um well so i, I think these values are actually these goods are kind of hard to talk about because mm -hmm. i think the language we assign to them actually doesn't capture their particular shape and texture mm. um uh, someone who talks about this, by the way, it, um, is Joe Edelman, and he, his work has influenced me a lot. Um, mm. <clears throat> and um, but that said, I would say the biggest one I was missing was just kind of like being an artist. <laughs> I think um, I've always felt like an artist internally, and then to do EA, I was I was shifting myself over to more of like an archetype of uh, like a grind set entrepreneur or something like that. Like I was explicitly trying to be more like Elon Musk um, and neglecting that I also just need to like make songs and um, write novels <laughs> and stuff like that. Um, and then, but I guess more recently the way I've been actually combining these two sides of me is through something that my, um, my girlfriend pointed out, which is that she, after I threw this one crazy theme event, um, her uh, feedback for me was that, uh, like, that you know, then this this kind of like event throwing and community building has always felt like a different part of me, but um, she thinks that essentially my artist is trying to similar to when I was like very young, trying to create worlds, and like that's the topic of interest for my inner artist it's not like painting a, a picture it's like working alongside people to form interesting social habitats essentially and like social circumstances and environments um and recently i've been getting a lot of like internal energy from regarding what i do as more of a the art of worlding rather than these things that are more um practically minded like community building or movement building or things like that mm. Can you tell me more about your relationship with creativity and, you know, writing novels and also, you know, you've, we alluded to this earlier, but you've learned a lot about clowning. Uh, I'd be curious to hear about your relationship to these things. Mm. I'm glad you bring up clowning because I feel like I'm falling too much into a podcast guy. <laughs> <laughs> <Yes. laughs> you told me you would interrupt me if I ramble. Oh. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Let me open the window. One second. Mm -hmm. There you go. Yeah, you're the you're the only podcaster 
person I agreed to do a podcast with in like a long time because ah, I, okay. I get so much into this mode of being like, here's what I think. I think <laughs> influencer persona. <laughs> ah. Yeah, yeah awesome. I'm really interested in you as a whole person. Like I am interested in your ideas and the things you've done, but um, how to put it? I don't. I don't think I'm really satisfied for with how I would talk about this. But just people are intrinsically so beautiful and so precious, and like as a whole person, and what it means to like. I'm getting this image of entering someone's heart and like what it feels like to be them, or you know, I'm getting this picture of you as a kid. Just like I mean, I, I really relate to this of like playing with toys and like building worlds and just like yeah, the ideas are really cool, and also just what it's like to be you is really interesting, and it's both similar to me and that reveals things about me and it's different than me so i can learn about what it's like to be someone that's different than me and mm -hmm. um yeah i'd love to, basically i'd love to stay connected to these ideas and also feel free to show your whole self no it's not it's not you it's me yes whenever someone like puts a microphone in front of me i go into like my influencer zone <laughs> <laughs> next time i have to burp i'm just going to ritualistically make it really loud at the uh -huh. perfect um, yeah that's the remainder of my gut condition. If, I still like 50 times a day. If your Thinkfluencer had a mask, what would the mask be? Like, <laughs> well, how would you paint that mask? Interesting. I'm looking at my masks that I have here. Yes. So I was, I was in this um, mask workshop recently. I think it would like, would it look like this? No, it would look like, um, I don't know. He would have like a, a like a, like nicely gelled hair uh -huh. and um, a collared shirt that's a little bit less flamboyant mm. and make like really relevant eye contact whenever he was making a point. <laughs> <laughs> so funny. And um, he'd probably wear cologne. Ooh. Ooh, sexy. It's actually a good idea. You know what? Next... Uh, next podcast or whatever I go on, I'm going to deliberately dress that way. Uh -huh. As the as the interview continues, I'm just going to start like stripping, like uh -huh. up the hair. You and can, I'll like have, smear war paint on your face. Yeah, or smear war paint. And then I'll have like a goofy thing underneath my button, button on chair. <laughs> like a giant swirl or an optical illusion. Mm. <laughs> Let's go. I love that. When can I watch this? <laughs> Um, we could do a second interview. There we go. <laughs> um, I forget. What, sorry, I forget what question you asked. Yes, me too. Actually, that's rare. Um, I know I was asking about different qualities of. Oh yes, artistry and creativity and novels and clowning. Yes. How do I relate to those things? Yes. Um, I mean, if you want a more practical, specific question, like how did you start to get interested in clowning, and what was that like for you? Hmm. Well, it's, it's relevant to what we talked about before, mm. actually. Mm. Mm. It it came from being, yeah, kind of fed up with um, my like adult personas, mm. <laughs> and this and this desire for intimacy, like greater intimacy with people, where I could drop those. And um, thanks to uh, Anne Lorraine Selke. Uh, Zelke, she pointed me um, to this uh, tradition called pachinko clowning, and um, I I was so uninterested because my I mean my archetype of the clown is like a guy who wears a red nose and like mm. you hawk his nose and he like shoots you with a little water gun or, mm. or a flower that shoots water or something. I'm like I don't want to do that. That seems like more performance. <laughs> Um, but pachinko clowning is like the opposite. It's like less performance. Um, and the workshop, which I did with Sue Morrison, the, the name of it is clown through mask. Um, because the idea is essentially where, well, okay. Here's my hermeneutics of it. The, the interesting mm. thing about the workshop is she almost never described anything that was happening or gave any theory. It was just like, here are the practices, let's do them. And they were extra weird and very effective. Mm. And then people were like, but how does it work? What does it mean? And she's like, eh. <laughs> which is a very clown attitude. Uh -huh. um, but um, I kind of, the philosophy that I get from pachinko clowning is that like, we're kind of always wearing a mask. Mm. And 
And those masks aren't necessarily inauthentic, but they're covering up other possible masks or they're in the place of other possible masks. And um, the workshop was like two weeks. And over the two weeks, we made two different masks. I can show them actually. Um, here was my first one. Mm. And um, the masks like, she has a broader concept of mask than a physical mask like this. The physical mask is just like the uh, kind of like the symbolic culmination of the actual mask, which is a full body thing. Like there's a lot of emphasis on once you find the mask, you you uh, let it go through your entire body and your bones and even your eyes and things like that. And you let it kind of um, possess you is the wrong word because we think of possession as being like something external that comes in and, and takes you. But the masks in the Pachinko workshop felt a lot more like a long forgotten part of yourself is allowed to like fully inhabit your body. So you could call it like an internal possession or something like that. And then at a certain point, you um, mold with your eyes closed a piece of clay. And then that becomes the mask that you paper mache. And then, and but then you only, you only spend like a half an hour actually putting it on. And then the rest is just, you have it internalized and you can switch into it whenever you want. And so, um, <clears throat> yeah, I discovered like parts of me through this training that felt so me like to the point where it was almost criminal that I felt like I had forgotten them and forgotten how to inhabit them. Um, and so sometimes when I get close to people, I let them invoke my masks. <laughs> mm. I tell them like, here are the, here are the masks. You know, now I think there are like eight that I've trained in. And I'm like, whenever you want, you can just like call mm. one of them out and then I'll fall into it. But um, what is, I guess what is common across all the masks and to like clowns in general is that um, they're not afraid to be ridiculous. And that's, I think that's often what these adult personas are covering up, like our natural ridiculousness. And the ridiculousness often comes from just blocking the impulse to um, exhibit whatever's happening inside, outside, essentially. Mm -hmm. And then when you see adults doing that, it's like hilarious, but not because the adult is acting and trying to entertain, but because it's like we recognize that, oh, fuck, we're supposed to suppress that. And this person is just showing it like, mm. you know, the, uh, an adult clown in this in this pachinko mode, like might get really intrigued by someone, like maybe someone that they're attracted to and they feel like embarrassed by it. But, you know, they have to show that embarrassment like mm. across their face and body. You can't like. But otherwise, the teacher will yell at you, basically. Mm. And so um, everything you try to cover up eventually is just stripped away because the teacher's like, I don't believe you, like you're, you're hiding or whatever. And then you're doing it all while maintaining eye contact with the audience members. <laughs> mm. And so let's say, you, yeah, you like go up to someone and you're like really interested in them, but then you like have the impulse to sniff them. So, of course, you do because you're in clown mode. Um, but then they smell bad, then you wouldn't hide your reaction, <laughs> even <laughs> if you would normally be polite to. And so you would go, oh, ew. Uh -huh. And then the person might be upset. And then you might be upset that you made them upset. So you might start literally crying. Uh -huh. <laughs> and like, that's how this, yeah, that's how this modality of clowning goes. So, you know, I've encountered other forms of clowning. And I think um, they're all really interesting at like teaching adults how to play again. But I... Pachinko is the only one which I feel like I could call almost something like a spiritual path because, um, yeah, the honesty of presence that it results in is just so amazing. And like the amount it can like get you into just an endless flow state is is just really beautiful. And and a flow state that includes other people, um, unlike a lot of meditative practices, you're you're practicing this like immediate presence with other people in the room. So it's like hugely relational. And what so, was that like for you? Terrifying. Hmm. <laughs> um, almost all the masks or the different clowns that I discovered were like very shy. Hmm. <laughs> and at least the the ones that are in the, in this in Pachinko, you have every mask has an innocent side and an experienced side. 
and so my my experience sides which were like more adult they weren't really afraid of people but um all the versions that were the innocent side yeah they were like really alienated and scared and would often like hide behind little blankets mm. and if someone would like tear away the blanket then I would start crying <laughs> mm. um or I would be like playing off in my little world that kind of thing yeah mm. What kind of qualities did doing these practices open up for you? Mm. I mean, I think the biggest one is just honesty. Mm. Um, honesty in that, like, I think our concept of lying is weirdly limited to language. Like, if I told you I'm wearing a hat right now, like, that, <laughs> that would be a lie because I said one thing and the truth is like another. But um, I think spoken language isn't the only language like we're mm. constantly i believe that we're constantly trying to portray some version of reality through so many different channels not just our words but like you know like i talked to before about our energy mm. uh, or you might say your vibe like the way that you hold your body you know to give a simple example um like right now i didn't have my coffee this morning so if i were to <laughs> if i were to be fully honest like I would be talking to you a little bit more like this. Mm, mm -hmm. And the fact that I'm instead talking to you like this, like that's a lie. Mm. <laughs> I'm, I'm like portraying myself as being a lot more alert than I actually am. Or if um, I was like bored and I was just like pretending to make eye contact and like, listen, even if I was like, right. oh, this is boring or something, then that would be a lie. I think that's a lie. And yeah. you know, I'm not, I'm not anti-lie. Mm -hmm. Like, I, I tweeted about this and a lot of people got upset because mm. they're like, but we need these things. And I'm mm. just like, yeah, we like lying smooths things out in society. And mm. I don't think lying is bad. Um, I do think lying can tend to feel bad, especially the more that you do it. Mm. Um, and so I think, you know, I'm not telling people not to lie from a moral stance or myself not to lie from a moral stance. It's actually more just like, I think you, if you do it too much, it just like feels really bad. Hmm. 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 Interesting. Yeah. I'm gonna have to. I've actually been thinking a lot about honesty and lying recently, and um, yeah, I really appreciate those reflections. I want to ask about your fiction and um, sort of a similar question of asking about what, um, what writing fiction means to you and what that's like for you and can feel a different form of this question that I'd like to ask, which is um, if there's a sense that an artist is making their art on their own terms and like by their own rules and it has this, it's this end in itself, like even if no one ever read your novels and no, or no one else liked them or something, but you're like, no, I, I fucking love this. This is awesome. And like, I wrote the thing I wanted to write. What's that like for you to write fiction? Like, what mm -hmm. are the rules you're playing by or something that makes your own fiction beautiful to you? Mm. Well, I think this is, this is where um, it gets tricky to talk about ends in themselves or like goods mm -hmm. because the scale actually isn't uh, fiction because the fiction is like almost a container. Me writing fiction is a container for like so many different ends. Mm -hmm. There's like, um, yeah, there's the the flow state of just a long writing session and being like, like having it come through me and like barf, be, be barfed out. There's the end of like exploring um, hidden sides of myself through characters representing those different sides almost like doing ifs through fiction mm. um there's the good of like um writing poetically and like working with rhythm inside of the sentence and punctuation and like that level of craft then there's like the good of um creating really satisfying story arcs and then, of course, there's the good of like having people read it and say, this is cool. <laughs> or, like this influenced me in these ways. Um, and so. Yeah, for me, fiction is kind of all of that. And mm -hmm. I think 
things that feel good to people, I think tend to actually not just be one thing, but be like a container for like many good things. Hmm. Um, yeah. I, if, I, I don't know if I answered your question. <laughs> yeah, you did in a way. I'm going to ask it again in a different way because I think there's a bit more here of say, let, let's just say that you wrote 10 novels the rest of your life and you know, the eighth one, you were like, oh, that at the end of your life, you're like that one, the eighth one that you wrote, you know, in I don't know, 2037 or something like that one. That one was my favorite. You're like, that one was just awesome. I fucking love that one. What what do you think the qualities of that novel would be? The one that you wrote in 2037, the eighth one mm. that you were like, oh, hell yeah, that was the best one. I think it would. um I think it would be like the whole thing would be in prose tree. Mm. Um like ex very accessible prose tree. Like it's important for me I don't I don't I, it's important for me to have things be very readable and I think they have to be these days because people are so distracted. Mm. You, you need to yeah, give someone something that can outcompete like Twitter, which is amazing, or TikTok. Um <laughs> mm. and so it has to be very engaging. Um but I think it would still be in, it would almost be like reading um, a poem, but a poem that you can understand. And it would still have all the normal elements of like characters and arcs and things like that. But yeah, my that's what I'm working on right now. I'm taking a poetry class as part mm -hmm. of Fractal University with uh, Ali Bonig. And my hope with that is to get my when my prose style is much more closer to poetry, I feel like much more satisfied with it. And then I also enjoy writing it a lot more. Hmm. Hmm. Appreciate hearing about it's that. It's a lot more vulnerable to do that. And so I feel, I, it's not my typical style because I have to like depend more on the muses. Hopefully that turns out to just be a limiting belief. Hmm. Uh, and then also like, I'm just showing a lot more of myself and it's not it's also not very efficient like it's not the best way to move a plot along or like have the story be the way that you wanted it to be because mm. poetry ends up being pretty wild <laughs> i'm glad you're working on that i i think I, that would not be at least currently i imagine that wouldn't be as much fun for me but it sounds like that would be very rewarding for you so i'm happy for you <laughs> um let's see i have the impression that on Twitter you ask for help a lot and you like ask people for advice or you make requests or things like that. And I wonder about your relationship to asking for help. And um, mm, yeah, by contrast, I don't tend to ask for help on Twitter a lot. And so I'm curious about your relationship to asking for help. Mm. Well, asking for help on Twitter is a little bit different than ask asking for help offline. Mm hmm. Asking for help offline is often a lot more intimidating mm. as there's like a particular person you're asking for help and then they might be looking at you while they say, no, I can't do that. And then you mm. feel bad uh -huh. um, or they feel bad or both. On Twitter, the nice thing about in social media in general, the nice thing about asking for help is you're just asking for help to like the void. Right. And then there's not that awkward social friction of, um, someone having to reject you. I, I think everyone should get comfortable, by the way, with just being rejected in their ask for help in person. Um, but it's it's just very easy for me to ask for help on Twitter because, you know, there are 12,000 people following me and all the ones that aren't interested just won't respond. And then maybe if I'm lucky, like one or two will respond. And then often it ends up being like very useful. Hmm. Also because the chances of like, especially if you have over a hundred followers, the chances that one in a hundred people can help you are obviously much higher than just asking a single person. Mm -hmm. So I've gotten like people helping me with very outlandish requests, you know, like, does anybody know an immigration lawyer who works on specifically O-1 visas because my friend wants to stay in the country? And then like three people will get back to me <laughs> and say like, talk to me or talk to this person which is just not something you would get like if I turned to a random friend um, necessarily. And like the the this room that I'm in, I got it because I asked for help basically. Well, did I ask for help? Yeah, I did. Mm. 
Um, I had a housing situation fall through. I was trying to put together a big group house. Um, and then at the last minute it fell through due to the, the owner. Um, well, it's a long story, but basically someone offered $500 more. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and they went with them. And so suddenly I just, I had given up my lease and I had to like scramble to find a new place. Um, and then my friend Shanti, um, who back then I did not know, um, she was just a Twitter follower. Uh, she DM'd me and was like, hey, I might have a place for you. And now I like live in her house. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like one, one of the best living situations I've ever been a part of. Mm. So I, I think more people should be asking for help on social media because the, the kind of stuff that comes out of the ether is always, is or not always, but very often um, unexpected and amazing. Do you remember how you learned this lesson or uh, developed this attitude towards social media and asking for help? Yeah, I do. Um, well, let me see when it started. I guess I can see the the roots of it early on when, um, so I was in Boy Scouts. And then if you get to the end of Boy Scouts, you have the option to become an Eagle Scout. And for that, you have to do some kind of fancy project. And someone encouraged me. Um, I was I was building this boardwalk at um, a local camp. Mm -hmm. And someone encouraged me to just start cold calling different places that could supply the materials and ask if they would do it for free. And I was just, I was like totally shocked by how many of them just said like, sure, here are mm -hmm. like a hundred two by fours or like, yeah, you need cinder blocks. You you can just have these cinder blocks. Mm. We're happy to support a boy scout. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I think that was a formative experience for me because I had never realize the extent to which random people you don't like strangers are willing to help other strangers hmm. um, and I think a lot of people will die unfortunately without realizing this because they they'll never have tried um, and so after that uh, Eagle Scout project I started just kind of ramping up the extent to which I was doing that until the point I, I thought I think probably the peak of this was when I um, created this nonprofit that I talked about the mobile cognitive science lab um, and to fundraise for that, the initial crowdfunding campaign, which I did in college, I went through the directories of, um, museums and cognitive science departments, like throughout the world, like mm. probably over a hundred of them. And I, I, I don't think I would do this anymore. It feels kind of like polluting the commons, but, mm. um, at the time I, uh, emailed all of them <laughs> and, uh, like, probably over a thousand people. I think it came to like 3000 people asking if they would pitch in to like a graduating college students first big project. Hmm. And um, a ton of them contributed. And then uh, a lot of them or not a lot of them, but a few of them referred me to even bigger funders who then came in with like thousands of dollars. And uh, yeah. And then as like a not even graduated college student, I had a huge, a uh, pile of money to start my first nonprofit with <laughs> Wow! Uh, from strangers. Um, I mean, some friends and family contributed, but I, you know, there were, I, I don't, back then I didn't really have anyone wealthy in my circles. Mm. So, you know, I contributed at most probably like a hundred bucks. Um, but um, yeah, I think people are uh, like, are regularly underestimating the, the amount that random internet strangers can like come to their aid. Mm. And then no longer be random internet strangers, but your friend. Well, that's what, yeah. And that's what happened, especially mm -hmm. with some of the, the big funders who mm -hmm. came in. They're still in my life. Mm. How you alluded to this distinction earlier between asking for help on social media to sort of the void versus making a request to someone specific in your life. And I wonder, it sounds like you're comfortable with the rejection, but how do you relate to asking for help with specific people? Mm, yeah, it's still something I'm working on. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it feels really easy when I think that there's something tangible that they're going to get out of it. Um, for instance, recently, I asked my friend Andrew Blevins to um, co-run this kind of residency program we're running. It's called Archipelago Project Lab. And so we have about 40 people. You're, oh, you're, you're one of them mm -hmm. uh, working in small crews that support each other. Uh, to create big ambitious projects. And um, 
it was easy for me to ask him if he wanted to do that with me because I thought it would be like very valuable for him too. Um, <clears throat> he's been wanting to get experience like running running things at that scale. Uh, and I think he enjoys hanging out with me. So there was that aspect and I enjoy hanging out with him. But then for things like um, asking people to help me move or um, or I don't know, let's say I'm like, in bed under the covers and asking like my girlfriend, Hey, would you mind like passing me my phone from over there? Mm -hmm. Like I, I, I'm coming around to doing that, but I'm, it still feels <laughs> scary or bad. Like I'm imposing or something. Like Even if though you can't I, imagine a way that it would help someone or be nice for them or something like that. Well, of course I can intellectually, mm -hmm. uh, just on an emotional level, but Doesn't yeah, I feel that way. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, in, all, in, in almost all cases in which I would do that, ask for help, like, I have friends like helping itself is one of these things that can just be an inherent good. Mm -hmm. And so, um, for instance, when I helped my mom and my sister to move uh, into this apartment, I think that was actually a nice thing for them to receive. I don't think they received that. And they were, I mean, I'd have to ask them, but my sense of like, of it was that they were enthusiastic to participate because it just feels good to help someone that you care about mm -hmm. uh, and they didn't need something like tangible in return. Mm. Um, yeah. I want to ask about uh, something that we've talked about before, but uh, privately about you've, in fact, I found this tweet going back to 2021 that you were writing about this. I'll, I'll read this tweet now. You said, I actually know about as many generative and intellectually brilliant women as I do men, if not more. The main mm. difference seems to be that the women tend to publicize their work less. So you need to be lucky enough to meet them in person. You won't find most of their stuff online. And then you also said, um, I keep thinking of two women I know who I'm pretty sure have revolutionary content on the nature of mind. Both mm -hmm. have been saying they should write up their stuff for years now, but they've produced like three to four Google Docs for private consumption. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, continues to be true. Continues to be true. Yes. <laughs> That's I mean, right. Those two specific women. Yes. Uh, how did you start to notice that pattern and what do you think about it? I just realized I probably should have invited them to become part of Archipelago. Mm. Um, how did I notice that pattern? I mean, it was hard to ignore. Um, just I was having on a daily basis, like galaxy brained conversations with some of these women in my life. They were like profoundly altering my mm, metaphysics, morality, um, social interact the way I socially interact and um and then and yeah you can't find their stuff anywhere mm. <laughs> except it like I said in if you're lucky they have a secret google doc mm. the person whose um apartment I'm staying in right now is another one of these that's mm -hmm. that was actually the initial context in which she contacted me mm -hmm. or maybe it was the secondary one I forget but she said like hey I read your tweet and um I also have secret Google Docs. I mm -hmm. wonder what you think of them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <They're> brilliant. <laughs> Except uh, you won't find her on YouTube. What do you think causes the conditions such that uh, these women have both such incredible gifts to give the world and they're quite private about it? Um, well, to answer the, the first question, the gifts, I think... Um, so I won't get into um, biological sex, but I mm. at least think there are gender cultures, very strong gender cultures. And um, and there are more than just like, there's there's more than just one, obviously, woman gender culture. But um, on the whole, uh, being a woman and being in that culture, like that culture trains you to pay much more attention to nuance, um, to pay attention to what emotions you're feeling in response to something. Um, to micro expressions on other people's faces and what that means about their attitude towards you. Um, and you're doing like really intense, you might say computation even there. You're like paying attention to what they must think of you looking at them right now and how they're responding to then seeing that you realized that. <laughs> mm. It's like very complex and loopy and like many different meta levels. 
Um, and so I think, yeah, I think woman gender culture might predispose one um, to paying more attention to like, yeah, the sensory details of the world um, as opposed to male gender culture, which I think causes, this is just on average, just uh, men to pay more attention to like uh, concepts over sensory or emotional experiences. Hmm. But then I think when you end up with a woman who is also interested in concepts, then they're infusing those concepts with a lot more content, like experiential content. And men, are, I think men are often kind of like talking out of their ass when mm. they're interacting with concepts because the concepts are kind of hollow. They're just doing like, yeah, language manipulation when they're talking about like, and is freedom more important than beauty? Or like, <laughs> I'm like, bro, what do you actually mean? Like mm. what life experiences, uh, you know, like actually went into this, these two different things and like, you know, even when you're asking them to define their terms, they're often just defining them. Like it doesn't bottom out in terms of experience and experience is just like, has many more dimensions of freedom and like, or you could just say richness, like mm. there's just stuff in experience than there is in concepts. Um, and so if you have a woman who uh, is infusing that kind of uh, gender predisposition to pay attention to sensory and emotional experience into concepts, then you can end up with some really fucking powerful concepts. And so I think that's my crackpot theory about what's going on in terms of like their gifts. Um, and in terms of the, the second question was like why they don't publish basically. Yes. Um, well, the most, I, I think one of the most, I, I think there are lots of normal reasons. Like I think alongside um, woman gender culture, there's just less of the bravado of like, you know, pronouncing your thing as being the great thing um, and so on. Um, but I, a reason I've come across pretty frequently when actually talking, since our conversation, I've been talking to some of these, uh, you called them wisdom queens, which mm. is, still makes me, I, I love that label. Mm. <laughs> um, I've been talking to some of these wisdom queens um, and asking them like, what, so what is it? Why, what is the, like, what is at the root of this fear of putting your stuff out there? And I think just as a as a man online, I haven't been exposed to the level of vitriol that women tend to be exposed to online. Mm. That's, that's a common theme when I talk to them. Like, um, like sure, like people will still pile on to a guy and like insult them and whatnot. But like the types of insults tend to be different. Like, yeah, just the sorts of things that get flung at women, who, especially who get really popular, are crazy. Like, you know, rape threats, mm. uh, death threats. And then just like, you know, things like get back in the kitchen, like all these like really gruesome gender war style things. Um, my yeah, my experience is that women get much more attacked for trying to like put themselves out there. And so that's what a lot of women I know are paying attention to. And so it's kind of a reasonable fear, like, you know, getting attacked feels really bad mm. <laughs> and getting attacked in these like really gruesome ways feels even worse. Um I suspect the way out of it just has to be, and I haven't, you know, I haven't even done this for myself, but just becoming okay with being attacked. And that's mm. like a very difficult uh, piece of personal development because we've evolved to care a lot about what other people think of us. Mm. Mm -hmm. It seems like uh, a sort of short-term midterm solution that I see a lot of women employing is like asking for a lot of feedback and getting a lot of feedback from a lot of different people about something before sharing it publicly. And mm, that yeah. may be contributing to a sense of safety where it's like, Oh, like if my various friends have seen this and they weren't like, this is horrible or terrible or something, then it's okay. And all the small changes kind of contributing to uh, a sense that it's okay to put something out there. I, I notice, um, I mean, we've talked about this before, but, one of the things I've noticed about is um, just often women will ask me for feedback on something where I would be like, I would just post that now. It's fine. And you can always improve it later. Like right. you Very can, um, but it's like, you know, I think a, a lot of getting a lot of feedback from a lot of different people that you really respect and like making it as good as it, as you possibly can before you share something publicly seems to make women feel safer a lot of the time. So that's, that's what I've seen. However, for the women I'm thinking of, 
Mm. Um, it often kind of backfires. Like, mm. um, so you know, I don't think it's some ultimate moral good to put your stuff put your stuff out there. I think mm. some sometimes it's fine to just have a secret Google Doc that you just share with five closest friends and like they're your target audience. However, I didn't think for the wisdom queens I'm thinking of, like their 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 systems and their thoughts would be of like enormous benefit. Enormous benefit. Um, and so for a lot of the ones I'm thinking of, they get they get stuck in, in my opinion, in an infinite cycle of like sharing their thing with their confidants, asking for feedback, their confidants provide feedback, they go back, revise it, then right. share the version. And, and it's just like this infinite right. cycle of sharing only with the closest confidants. And it's never good enough to share widely um, for them. I mean, I, I'm like you, I'm like, usually the first draft they send me, I'm like, you should just put the, post this right now. <laughs> <laughs> this is great. Um, and um, that, and then I think often another pattern I see is sometimes they share it with one person who's like, maybe not the right person at that stage to share it with mm. and they, a form of negative feedback that then they find very discouraging. Right. You know, like they have some friend who's just like, who enjoys being an asshole or something mm. or whatever. And they're like, and they, they might just say, I just don't think this whole thing is very good. Mm. And then I'll just never share it. And then sometimes that will set them back like years. <laughs> Damn. I mean, yeah. this happens to men too, but sure. um, just on this topic, like the, the wisdom queens I see not sharing their stuff tend to fall into these patterns. Right. I want to ask about a similar thing of uh, what, a little while ago you posted, and I'll, I'll read this. You said, um, I wrote and analyzed a 20 person list of anyone I've seen go sustainedly super Saiyan. That is anyone who's become radically more capable of creating what they want to see in the world. Um, and then you were listing what you learned from that. And I'm curious, like what prompted you to make that list and what did you learn from that? Hmm. Well, actually, some of the part of what I had in mind while writing that was some of these wisdom queens mm -hmm. where I'm like, I have a lot of people like that, not just women, men and women in my and in between also um, or neither <laughs> in my world um, who I think have like enormous gifts to offer. Um, actually, that's the wrong frame. I think it would be like also good for them. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't I don't think it's I don't think the only reason you should do bigger ambitious things is to like offer something to the world. I think a lot of people, I think would just get a lot of satisfaction out of like working at a bigger scale. Um, and I was just trying to wonder, I was, I was wondering like, um, like what separates them right now from the people who I've seen um, like blow up in that way, like go from, I don't know, like the, the classic Brooke Bowman story is great. Like she was like homeless with the drug addiction and she's tweeted about this. Um, and then she went to running like a, a hugely popular festival vibe camp that like is at the center of our online community now. Mm. Um, and I'm like, so what, yeah, what causes people to make that transition is what I was pondering. And this is kind of like also the prelude to wanting to run another residency program, mm -hmm. uh, the mm -hmm. prelude to Archipelago. And what did you learn from making this list? What were the trends that you noticed? Well, um, the main, the overall trend that I noticed was that they went and started a like, let me try to remember, the ingredients where they started something that was public facing. And that seems to be important because then like, there was almost this, once you get into a feedback loop with the public, there's like, almost like an accountability Hmm. or or maybe people want to like at least for me like I want to save face when something has been put out there so I don't want to like one day be like hey I'm starting a new bake stand you should come by this Saturday hmm. and the next day be like actually I'm too shy to do that so I'm not <laughs> doing it anymore <laughs> like that just feels bad hmm. so I think yeah public was important and then also public is important because then once you put something out there like I was talking about with the um, strangers helping you thing like strangers just show up <laughs> and I, I think a lot of people haven't had this experience like you put something out there and then just a random person in Bali is like hey you should meet my friend who's also in New York um, he's a philanthropist mm. and I think he would want to fund you you know something like that um, so yeah public 
And then what were the other ingredients? Mm. Let me look at the particular cases again. Mm. Oh, right. It was public. It was also something that they seemed to be kind of like magnetically drawn to. So I don't think this is something you can do by just like forcing yourself to take on a big ambitious project. In almost all the cases that I have here, um, like they would have had, they would have had to stop themselves from working on the thing. Like the thing was just very compelling. Like in one case, I'm thinking of um, kind of borderline case. No, I guess it's a it's a case that counts. I'm thinking of like Katie Devaney, um, who started the Berkeley Alembic. And I remember I was I was living with her when she was brainstorming this thing, and just the she was definitely afraid of. starting something so big because previously sure she had run a meditation collective and um she had been in a phd program but she'd never done something at this scale but the excitement was like overcoming the fear and mm. so i think you need that magnetism to like keep you from being thrown off and i think you also need it to not get burnt out like it has to be something you actually yeah fills you with life um what are the other characteristics Oh, typically the thing that they worked on also like transformed or was was like just beyond their actual current abilities. Mm -hmm. So it required a, a personal transformation to be able to do the thing. Mm -hmm. um, I think you see this often in like emergencies when people people surprise themselves by like exhibiting abilities or like reflexes is a very common thing, like dodging the car just in time. Um, and you you shock yourself at the at what's possible um, once you need once you're responding to necessity, and so I think in a lot of these cases, um, people are working on something that then makes demands on their skill level that is just like above what they can currently fulfill, and so they but then they just like jump to fulfill it essentially. Uh, is there anything else? Yeah, I think the I mean the the basic. sentence that I wrote was like combining all these things is to passionately launch into an ambitious public facing project. So the passion is the, is that kind of magnetism. Um, I guess launch is an important word because you actually have to do it. <laughs> like mm. I see a lot of people like, especially these wisdom Queens, <laughs> mm -hmm. um, like paving the way for it. Um, you know, learning the right skills for it, doing an internship that can prepare you, getting the degree first that can enable you. And like almost all, every time I see this pattern, I'm just like, it's just avoidance. You need mm -hmm. to launch into it. And you, you basically need to trust that um, it's either okay to fail. You might fail and that would just be okay. Um, or that you're going to like jump and meet the challenge. Um, How yeah, does so thinking about all this shape your... the way you designed Archipelago and what you're trying out with this residency. Yeah, well, um, definitely Archipelago was built to, I, I, th I think the place where people, actually most people get stuck is is the launch part. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> uh, I have lots of friends who uh, uh, like have these big dreams that, I, I'm, that I think they are capable of and um, I think would be like really good mm. and they just don't launch. Um, And so the archipelago is structured to have like a kickoff. And then at the end, there's an expo where people show off what they did, but that mm. kind of like, it forces you to actually make it happen. Like mm. you don't have time over the six weeks to get a degree first. Um, mm. You just have to do it. Um, and then there's the public facing piece also. Um, for the expo, as you know, I had people uh, invite Uh, someone in their life who they really want to impress to the final showcase. Mm. Uh, and I know if I'm inviting someone, I like I invited my friend Creighton, mm. and I think she would not mind if I showed up to the final showcase and was like, I didn't do anything, but I would feel immense shame. Mm. Um, and also I would find, I would feel immense shame at like presenting to her something that is like low quality. Um <laughs> So yeah, that part is built in. And then the ambitious piece, um, we largely curated through who we accepted. 
and also a question that we put in the application that was kind of an asshole question, but um, we had people write in their projects and then there was a follow-up multiple choice question with two options that said, like, is this what you work would work on if you had no fear or something mm. like that? <laughs> um, and so uh, hopefully that biased people to uh, pick projects that are more at the edge of their abilities and and something that is like bigger than that they would normally do. And then as for the passion piece, um, I don't know if we really, I mean, I think we just, it, for most people who applied, it just, they have day jobs mm. or they're at school or something like that. So if they're doing one of these things in their free time, it's it's pretty much always in, in, in the cases that we're looking at something that they really want to do. Mm. They just want to make time for it. You mentioned Katie earlier, who I know is in what you all call your trajectory club. How did that get yeah, formed right. and what's that been like for you? Mm. Yeah, trajectory club came out of the pandemic when it was, I lost all these social support structures for producing progress on my goals. <laughs> and I had had this idea that I was like very much a agentic individual. And so like, if I had a goal, I would just straightforwardly pursue it. And that turned out not to be true. What turned out to be true is that I was, I was almost always working in some kind of what you might call like institutional context, whether it was a social movement, like effective altruism or a university. Um, there was almost always something that was creating even a very loose structure, but a structure around what I was doing. Mm. And um, so I wanted to recreate those conditions and uh, I didn't want to do it with the baggage that a lot of external structures that you would move into um, forces you to adopt. Like if you're at a university, then you suddenly have to get good grades, mm. um, even if you don't care about that. So um, I was thinking, like, who are the two people in the world who, um, like, I most want to hold me accountable and I most want to, like, cheer me on, basically, um, and who would give me good advice? And so I thought of Katie and then my friend Creighton, who I just mm. mentioned, um, and asked if they wanted to do it. And they said, yeah. Mm. Um, and so we've been meeting for three years every week ever since then. And uh, they had never actually met in person until last week. Mm. Um, but, you know, it's felt like a little, not family quite, but like, a, yeah, a little odd, little crew, very, very tight for the whole time. I'm actually meeting with them after this. Okay. Yeah. Well, say hello to Katie for me. Yeah. Uh, what have you all learned from running that group? Like what helps it to go well and be so helpful to you all? Mm. Well, I mean, the structure really hasn't changed mm -hmm. that much. Um, the thing we do every time is we meet, we gossip mm. um, for a little bit, and then someone inevitably says, okay, should we do it? And, mm. then, and then someone else says, okay, yeah, seven minute timer. And then... Someone says, okay, I'll set it. And then we um, go into ourselves and then um, figure out what we want to do for the week ahead. Um, write that down and then write down also like what we want help with. And then we take turns talking about, oh, and also we, we review our previous weeks. So review mm -hmm. um, goals for the week and then what we need help with. Um, then we go around and we rotate talking about those things and getting help from one another. Um and that's been the structure for three years, but the the gossip part has increased at the beginning. And I think mm -hmm. that's actually good because ultimately um, another point of doing this is just that I get to hang out with two of my best friends every week. Mm -hmm. uh, so we like talk about our relationships and what's been going wrong and things like that. And then that often ends up being just as useful also as like this goal setting, like, like the more formal activity. And I've, I found that in a lot of containers that like you need the formal activity balanced by something informal, like sandwiched up against it. And they like complement each other. Totally. Hmm. Well, we've covered a lot of different topics. Is there anything else that you'd like to say more about or talk more about? Hmm. I think more people should be eating baklava. Hmm. I think it's one of the most undersung desserts. Hmm. And almost nobody knows that there are different types of baklava. There's Turkish baklava and Greek baklava, which are the mm. two main kinds that people know. 
the Greek stuff tends to come in bigger chunks and be less crispy and more filled with like, uh, like sweet syrupy stuff. Turkish stuff is kind of like that, but more crispy, more bite-sized. Um, but the baklava from the Levant, hmm. which is the most rare kind, is the best. Hmm. So that's baklava from Syria, Lebanon, and Palestine. Am I forgetting any countries that are part of the Levant? Hmm. Syria, Lebanon, Palestine. Anyway, those, I start with those three. And baklava from any of those, I guarantee you, if it's from a good place, is going to be... Um, the perfect amount of crisp. Hmm. It's often going to have uh, orange peel and uh, more cinnamon and cardamom added to it. It's going to be even more in a bite-sized form. It feels like that kind of baklava from Levant is like made for you, like not for a person, but it's like, you know, perfectly wieldy. And it's like, it's like every parameter is tuned to be pleasurable. Hmm. So I recommend trying to find a Palestinian, Syrian, or Lebanese place and getting their baklava. Hmm. And I often love... they have more variety. There's more innovate. There's more baklava innovation um, amongst the Levant. So like you have different sizes and shapes and you should just try them all. I love the baklava I've been privileged to try. So I noted, <laughs> noted. <laughs> the best place in New York City is Al Shem in huh. Astoria. Okay. Fortunately, it's not the best place in the world, but it's the best place in New York City. If you're in Berlin, um, I have to look it up. I'll, I'll put, I'll tweet about it or something. But there's a, the best place I've tried is in Berlin. Okay, <laughs> I, I could see myself making this tourist excursion of sorts to uh, Astoria to go to this place. So, <laughs> yeah, you mm. should. Astoria is great, and there's an Egyptian restaurant right near it that's also like otherworldly it's mm. a single guy who's he's he's a worlder you know i've talked about worlding he's created an entire world mm. um, it's not just the food which by the way is amazing and cooked by him and he like it's egyptian so he like it's a little bit sticky but he makes little pyramids out of the rice mm. but then um he also every single object in the place is made by him like mm. all the art, wow. all the benches, the ceiling, the floor. It's like his little world. And he's also amazing. I forget his name. Mm. Yeah. Um, what is the name of that? Al Albuquerque. Mm. He got like an award from the city. Like, a, <laughs> I didn't even know this existed, but he got like a good citizen award. And he has it on like a little plaque. And he's very, he's very proud of it as he should be. It's called Mombar. And it's down the street from Al Shem. Hmm. Noted. <laughs> Tyler's guy. You want to, to end, end with something really important? Yes, there, there it is. That's very <laughs> practical, life-giving, joyful. Yeah. Um, let's see. I'd like to say, what is it? Hmm. I think this conversation has been really interesting for me. Um, of course, I always love these doing these interviews and talking with people, but I see you as um, similar to me in some respects and different in other respects. And it's like nourishing to see the similarities and like clarifying and edifying to learn about what's different and uh, mm, how to put it, I'm missing something here. It's like, yeah, it's, mm, think you're very like colorful and playful and expressive in ways that I admire and like could use in my life so I got like a, a good a good um both like energetic hit of that but also some specific things I'm like oh yeah I could stand to do that more so I really appreciate you sharing yourself in this way and uh I'm glad we're friends me too mm. how, how do you think we're most different hmm I don't know if I have a vocabulary for it, but something like, mm -hmm. I mean, I don't know that this is all of it, but one of them that comes to mind is like, um, you were talking earlier about projects like being public and putting yourselves out there. And I noticed that I've, mm, with the work that I've done over the last couple of years, kind of valued something like um, letting it speak for itself or like just um 
putting it out there on my own terms and like not necessarily explaining myself or like how I'm like what the games are that I'm playing or how they play. And I think, um, yeah, I see you as, uh, being more like public and, um, putting yourself out there in a way that I might not feel as comfortable with or as familiar with or something like that. Um, that's part of what I, I was, I mean, this was sort of implicit in my questions earlier, but, um, how to put it. I recognized myself in the way you described yourself as a child and then also like learning new things about how to connect to people and then finding a balance between those things. And I feel like maybe we've had different, gone to different extremes or like learned different lessons with that or found a different balance. And so it's like sort of similar themes of exploration, but, and like values or things that we care about. And then just a different, like, mm, like specific balance of those values or like how we choose to show up. And so I don't know if I could describe them precisely, but yeah. Mm. So it comes to mind. On the topic of putting yourself out there, you just reminded me of two other things. Mm -hmm. Maybe this would help if any wisdom queens are watching this video. <laughs> one, one thing that helped me, which I don't see many people talking about, is to not identify with... Um, there's no version of yourself. There's no, ver I'll speak for myself. There's no version of me that I can put online that people can attack. That is my essence mm. <laughs> um, or in person. Like, I think this is one thing I got from monastic Academy and like some of my meditation experience where um, you can just choose to identify with something other than even your behavior, the products that you put out there, like those things for me, flow downstream from what I am, but are not me. Mm. And so people want to come out and attack them or maybe more uh, benevolently like critique them. That's like useful feedback. Um, and those, those are things which I can like tweak and shape throughout my life. And, you know, tangibly you look at adult development and people do dramatically change their patterns of behavior and like the sorts of things that they're putting into the world. And so there's, there has to be, if if you are still something, it, it's not that. <laughs> and so I think once one has that realization, like in one's bones, then it gets rid of a lot of the fear of putting yourself out there because you're not, you're like, you're putting out, you're not really putting yourself out there. You're putting out what emerges from yourself out there, including like, I even see my personality this way. I think my personality mm -hmm. is something that's emergent from what I am. Um, and the thing that I am, it's like, nobody can attack that actually it's invulnerable. And so is, so is everyone's <laughs> mm. beautiful that. And then, um, and then I think a lot of people get into trouble, uh, by entering algorithmic hell realms. Mm. My friend, Daniel Fong, uh, fell into one of these over COVID because she was trying to argue with people about like what the scientific facts were on the internet. And that resulted in her. Like the algorithm is like, okay, you like people, you like arguing. <laughs> <laughs> Let me show you more people that, argue. You, yeah, that are going to argue with you and you're going to fight them back. And then eventually her whole Twitter feed became people who she didn't like and who, who she was disagreeing with. And I think there's some value to, you know, having a curated Twitter feed of people you disagree with, but that shouldn't be your only source of information or interaction on the internet. Um, I, you know, I, I just basically never fight people on the internet. I think it's okay to not ever fight people on the internet because a, like, you're not going to change their mind. People change their minds in much higher feedback circumstances. So you're not, you're not morally obligated to change the minds of the wrong people on the internet, first of all. And second of all, even if you think you are, you're probably just not going to be able to do it. Um, you should meet them, get, you should have a call with them and then try to change their mind. But you being like, you're wrong. Here are the facts. Like, so few people are going to change your mind because of that. It's not how so it works. You don't even do it. You're just you're just telling the algorithm like send me more people to fight. Um, the algorithm just gives you more of what you do. And so, um, but by the way, I do uh, almost always engage someone who wants to fight with me or argue with me. I just try to turn it into like uh, a pleasurable, fun interaction with them, where one of us would be even capable of changing our minds because we both understand that we like want the best for one another. It's not always possible, but um, 
you know, if I start fighting them, then I'm just going to get more fight curation on my TL. So my advice for people who want to put themselves in a place where they can put something out there is like, you know, start liking the tweets and retweeting the tweets and commenting on the people's things where, you know, it's people you really want to, would want to spend time with in person because Twitter is like shaping your sense of what the world is by putting a certain crowd in front of you. And that might not be uh, the fact of the matter of like, what what is a representative crowd? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you might as well cause it to be a supportive crowd. Mm -hmm. Which you can do. You can just curate a supportive crowd for yourself on Twitter. <laughs> you mm -hmm. just have to understand like everything that I interact with, it's going to show me more of. Which is also true of the world. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for sharing that, and also for coming on. Uh, it's a joy to learn more about you and your ideas and also your soul and your character and how you show up with the different masks and playful attitudes you have. So thank you, friend. Thanks for having me on.